Well, we'll get started then. Um, good afternoon, everyone. This is Teresa Kimker, Chair of the Heritage Preservation uh, Commission, and welcome to our May 3, 2021 meeting. Uh, the Heritage Preservation Commission reviews applications for product projects at heritage sites or within the heritage districts of the City of St. Paul. And it also serves as an advisory body to the Mayor and the City Council on Municipal Heritage Preservation Matters for the City. All the documentation to be used for this meeting is available on the Commission website at www.stpaul.gov forward slash HPC. There will be no new documentation to be discussed or recognized at this meeting. Uh, during the meeting, please mute microphones except when recognized by the chair to speak. And after being recognized by the chair, commissioners and staff will <clears throat> need to state their name before speaking. And everyone else needs to state their name and address before speaking. All deliberation and voting will be done via roll call conducted by the chair and staff will be monitoring microphones and muting participants as needed. Uh, so um, with that, I will start with a roll call of the commissioners. Um, start with, uh, so I know that Commissioner Nelson is not gonna be with us today. Uh, Commissioner Bazat is here, Present. right? This is Commissioner Bazat. Commissioner Douglas. back to Commissioner Douglas. Commissioner George. I'm here. Thank you. Commissioner Lubke. Uh, Commissioner McDonald. Here. Hello. Commissioner Paroka. Here. Hello. And Commissioner Wagner. Uh, let me try Commissioner Douglas again. Yes, this is Commissioner Douglas. I'm in. Welcome. Uh, Commissioner Lucky. And Commissioner Wagner. Okay. Um, then uh, are there any conflicts of interest today? I guess we don't have a public meeting, so there should not be any conflicts of interest. Oh, so we need to adapt the agenda first, I guess. Um, we have an agenda for, for this today's meeting. Can I have a motion for adoption of the agenda? Chair, this is okay. Commissioner Bazat. I move approval or uh, adoption of the agenda. Thank you, Commissioner, Commissioner Bazat. George, a second. Okay, we have a motion to adopt the agenda. Uh, anybody opposed to that motion? Motion is, uh, the agenda is adopted then. And just to uh, let's see, then we have minutes for the March 22 HPC meeting, and we have minutes for the April 19, 2021 Education and Outreach Committee meeting. Um, can I have a motion to adopt those minutes and state that they are true and correct and um, that the uh, minutes should be adopted? Chair, this is Commissioner Bazat. I move approval if we can do it as a clump of the minutes from the March 22nd, 2021 meeting and the April 19th Education and Outreach Committee meeting as re true reflections in the meetings. Okay, thank you, Commissioner Bazat. And second for that motion. Commissioner Douglas, I second. Thank you. Uh, any opposition to that motion? If not, uh, those minutes are adopted. Then our uh, first item of business for today is the um, CLG review and comment for the proposed structure at 170 Western Avenue South. And um, is that your uh, staff report, Mr. Goss? Yes, it is. Uh, so uh, this is consultation and comment for Winslow Commons. Uh, this is a proposed uh, four-story multifamily apartment building providing 47 units of affordable senior housing. Uh, the State Historic Preservation Office has recommended that the HBC be contacted for comments on this project. Uh, a survey report identified 24 
properties in the area of potential effect. Uh, one property in the APE has been previously listed, and that's CSPS Hall, that is uh, locally designated and on the National Register. Uh, Hess Royce conducted uh, research on other area resources. You did receive a copy of their report uh, before the meeting. Uh, they determined that three uh, do not meet criteria of uh, consideration B, uh, moved properties or retain sufficient integrity to be on the National Register. Uh, due to pandemic restrictions on archives and repositories, HUD decided to treat the remaining eight properties as historic for the purpose of Section 106 review. Um, the site is near two local historic sites. Although it will be seen from these properties, it does not appear that the proposed structure will create an adverse effect to any of these structures or the other potential historic resources in the area. Uh, overall determination recommended by the consultant of the proposal is no adverse effect. Uh, and staff uh, suggest the HPC agree with that finding of no adverse effect. Any questions? Any questions for staff? Uh, I had one question about the section eight. Should I? Uh, is there going to be a presentation by HUD and others, or perhaps I? I believe they they're available to ask questions if if you want to ask them the question. My my understanding is that this is uh, this is the section one hundred six review has been sparked because of financial. Um, uh, mortgage refinancing, things like that. It's not a, it's it's not a uh, uh, building of the building, but the refinancing. Of no, the, I I under oh. I I understand that, and I just had one question about a statement in the memo, and it I don't know anything about this, so I will posit my ignorance immediately. But it had to do with. What does transferring Section 8 housing vouchers from another building mean? And more specifically, does that mean that the building from which the vouchers were transferred will no longer have those Section 8 vouchers? Um, this is Carrie Munson with HUD. I can answer that question. Um, so the property where the Section 8, Project Based Section 8 is right now, um, the owner is opting out of the Section 8 HAP contract. All residents, all Section 8 residents um, will receive uh, vouchers um, or they can move to, um, to the new location. So it's their choice whether they want a voucher. Um, if they move to the new location, then they, they, um, then they would remain under that project-based Section 8 um, contract. Um, if they choose to get a voucher, then they can move move with that voucher. But that's you know. Um, but they would be losing. Then, they would be losing the residents if, in other words, if they're not senior currently seniors, they wouldn't be eligible for the senior affordable housing. All of the, all of the residents are um, able to move. That's, okay. Okay, I just I I just had this vision of um, you know transferring one set of affordable housing units to another, leaving the former people stuck. But yeah, you're I mean, um, some people prefer not to have the voucher and feel that it's not as secure. Um, that's not necessarily HUD's um, viewpoint on that, um, but. You know that they remain um, eligible for a section. Their low-income housing is is preserved with the voucher. There we go. That answers my question, and thank you. You bet. Any other questions for staff? But chair, we should we should go through the roll call so we we make sure that oh. Yeah, you're right. I'm sorry. Um, let's go through the roll to see if there's any other questions for staff. Uh, Commissioner Bazat. I actually had one question, but it had to do with the Hess Royce report. 
on potential eligibility of some of the buildings they reviewed. Uh, if there are gaps in their report um, for eligibility, you know, how how does do any of these recommendations that these properties are eligible get followed up by any sort of survey or more intense research? Or won't they? Hi, this is Rachel Peterson with Hess Forest and Company. I'm here with Jenna Remfert, um, who wrote most of the report. Oh, hi, guys. Hi. Um, and our address is 100 North First Street in Minneapolis, if you need that. Um, but as far as for a Section 106 review, it's not planned that this would be followed up with any additional survey. Um, what SHPO has been doing recently is kind of creating this other category of properties that are determined eligible for a project review to allow that review to move forward. Um, and then if in the future someone else would want to do more research, you know, and for a potential tax credit project or what have you, then um, our research could form the, the base of an eligibility um, argument, but wouldn't be that it's not an official determination of eligibility. No, I, I, under, I understand that that was mostly a question to the city staff about whether or not any follow up will happen but yeah there were some there were some there were a few gaps in it and so i ended up writing myself some notes on the report but thank you sure chair um, i have no further questions thank you commissioner uh, is that commissioner douglas do you have any questions for staff no i don't have any questions thank you commissioner george I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner McDonald. Uh, no questions. Thank you. Thank you. And Commissioner Peralta. No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, then if we have, um, uh, do we have anybody that's here presenting on this, George, other than yourself? Uh, I believe that uh, they were available to answer questions and unless some of them want, someone wants to uh, say something. This is Luke. Hub <laughs> Sorry. This is Luke Hedberg with Bigos Management, uh, the the ownership group. I'm at 7356 Pine Tree Road. I'm available for questions if you have any for me. Thank you. If none, um, we will. I'll entertain a motion to. Uh, either to accept the recommendations of staff. Commissioner Bazant. Chair, I move that the HPC concurs with the finding of no adverse effect. Thank you, Commissioner Bazant. And a uh, second for that motion, please. This Commissioner George, I second that. Thank you. Uh, any discussion on that motion? So once again, I'm going to go through the roll call again, just to make sure that we give everybody an opportunity. Commissioner Bazat, any uh, questions or comments on that motion? Or any, any discussion on that motion? Nope. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Douglas? No. Thank you. Commissioner George? No questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner McDonald? No comments. And Commissioner Peroka. Uh, no comments. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, then I will call for a vote on the motion. Um, Commissioner Bazat. Aye. I support the motion. Thank you. Commissioner Douglas. Yes, I support it. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner uh, George. Yes, I support the motion. Thank you, Commissioner McDonald. Yes. Thank you, and Commissioner Perlka. I also vote yes. Thank you. The motion passes. And then uh, with that, then our next item, uh, business item of business, is the discussion on justice and equity in historic preservation, based on that um, YouTube. Uh, 
clip that was sent around to us earlier. So uh, re recentering the margins, justice and equity and historic preservation. Um, it was a virtual research symposium sponsored by the University of Maryland School of Architecture, Planning and Preservation. Um, this symposium highlighted historic preservation research and activism centered on advancing justice and equity. Um, and we had uh, we had three questions. Um, uh, one, are there are there counter narratives that should be developed and adopted for St. Paul? Um, and, and counter narratives were discussed during the uh, the presentations. Basically, are there other um, other groups out there that we need to also be preserving and talking about their story? Uh, two, how can we contribute, inform, and work towards a more just and equitable field in historic preservation? I think that's a question we've kind of been dealing with almost a year now. Um, and three, will historic preservation result in a process of healing or in the or in the perpetration of injustices? Perpetration, yes. So, um, Commissioner Nelson could not be with us tonight. He sent along, uh, he sent me some comments. I forward those to you. Um, I don't know if we want to read all of those into the record. I don't know if that's necessary. This is just a commissioner discussion. So, um, thoughts? Madam Chair. Madam Chair, this is Commissioner Perotka. Sorry, I had myself muted there. I apologize. Uh, Commissioner Perotka, yes. Yes, thank you. I uh, do have a few thoughts and comments. I um, um, have watched this uh, uh, presentation twice, and I kind of, there were a few things I picked up on. Uh, uh, one of the panelists, uh, was talking about uh, diversity, underrepresented communities, uh, new voices, and awareness. But at the end of the panel discussion, the only uh, uh, caller um, or listener with a question asked a question about where do, does the disabled community fit into historic preservation. And the panelist who was discussing awareness actually represented no awareness about this and thought it was an access issue to museums. I kind of thought that it was, and to one of the panelists' own admission, they're the same small group of uh, preservationists who have been talking to one another for over 25 years, kind of thinking that they still are <laughs> um, talking to one another. I, I think they were in good faith, but I really didn't find anything that I could hold on to. I was impressed with the work that doctors, um, uh, that doctors McGregor and Roberts were doing. But as a member of the queer community, I did not see much of a trust um, building uh, with what did seem kind of like an academic bubble. And a lot of terms they were using, like public history, were assumed that there, were, there was an agreed upon definition. I have no idea what that means, along with a lot of the other terms that they were using. It seemed well-intentioned, but again, nothing that I could really take a bite out of, or it did seem like they self, well, one panelist self-identified as a thought leader, and then talked about community members, practitioners. I'm not, it seemed kind of like the canopy of, self-preservation, not historic preservation, talking to down to the grassroots. And I kind of 
think I'd like to remain in the grassroots. Anyway, that's my comment. Thank you, Commissioner Peroka. This is Commissioner, Commissioner McDonald. Is that, do you have your hand up? Oh, Commissioner McDonald? I can wait for Commissioner McDonald. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, after viewing the symposium, um, my, my first takeaway had not much to do with content, but enormous, enormously to do with common language. Um, it it just seemed to be sort of inbred and uh, inexplicable to a lot of people, including me at times. I, I think uh, uh, Commissioner Nelson, his cheeky email last week sort of called that to the attention where he just sort of grouped together all of this uh, jargon and uh, it, it was <laughs> it was quite remarkable. Um, <laughs> I guess the other takeaway, and I think I agree with, uh, again, uh, Commissioner Nelson, that, you know, the the level of survey is really the starting point for a lot of um, dealing with these issues and uh, who makes those decisions and, and how they're made and where the funding's coming from, I, I think are significant. Um, that was my initial takeaway, like I said. Commissioner Douglas, I, I can't, I'm just on my phone, so I can't raise my hand. <laughs> okay, Commissioner uh, Douglas, I'm gonna let Commissioner Bazat weigh in here first and then I'll get to you next, okay? okay. I'll really try not to hold to my standard going on and on and on. Uh, and it, I'll, I'll just say at first, I. Totally agree with Commissioners Protka, McDonald, and Nelson in their responses to this particular seminar. They were those folks were talking to themselves. It took them 15 minutes to honor, thank you, gratitude, everything else. I mean, I just had to skip. It was. It took forever. Um, and I will say that I was unimpressed with the amount of jargon. This is something we that would not help anybody who isn't deeply familiar with the, the terms and the, the history of preservation or the current trends even in preservation to learn anything about what this recentering the margins might mean. I will also say that uh, during and after watching it, I took deep dives into some of the history of St. Paul's efforts I think that we have all talked about the issue of equity within the city of St. Paul and how both the preservation community and the city government need to work together to find ways to create a community of grassroots, thank you, Joe, Commissioner Proka, grassroots preservationists. And one of the uh, initiatives that was formed back in the early mid 2000s, about 2006, 2007, was something called Invest St. Paul. And its focus was on underrepresented neighborhoods and neighborhoods where housing was in trouble because of either quantity or more likely condition of the residences. And I, I just didn't hear anything about this. I will also say that I think. I hadn't realized how fortunate I was when I attended those three conferences last summer, the one that was dismantling preservation, the one that was the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions and the Minnesota Preservation Conference. All three of those had far more um, detailed and interesting ideas about he how people in other cities have approached this particular issue. And um, one of the things that was my takeaway, I had to print it out because this phrase struck me when at the conference. We cannot continue to ask people what places they value 
and then ignore what they tell us because those places fail to meet our standards. So I think as an HPC, this was not a very helpful. Um, in fact, it was rather troublesome uh, as, as a presentation because I think it moved us back, would, would have moved us back into the whole um, jargon doing the same thing just with the different communities. And I think St. Paul and the HBC are in a place where we're, we've been striving and talking about how do we engage more and more people in the activities of preservation. And I didn't get anything out of that 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 help that would help us focus. I think some of the other things that other set of presentations we saw was extremely was much more helpful and interesting and engaging. And so yeah, um, I pretty much got negative stuff out of it, but <laughs> In a way, that's good. It's like, OK, it feels in a way that the HPC is on a track to move forward much more quickly than we might think we are. So that was kind of positive. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bazat. Commissioner Douglas. Um, OK, so I my observation was that um, I thought the, uh, the Professor Lewis Hoyos was it? He said he taught architecture and historic preservation, and and um, you know I assume a, you know the, he's teaching in <laughs> in 2021, and I was just thinking back when I was in school. It's been over 40 years ago. I mean they didn't teach any diversity in architecture when I took classes in architecture, and I'm just kind of it's really interesting that. All these years later, they're still not teaching it because it said that, um, you know, well, and I remember when I was in school, I mean, it, it was uh, European architecture and um, American architecture. And, and, I, and I had to take a lot of art classes, but it was European art and American art and, and you know, nothing uh, covering pretty much um, other cultures. And but yeah, and I'm just it's just amazing that still well, I you know, I don't doubt it. I know how that is, because when I was teaching school, we weren't teaching, you know, other people's histories and cultures. But <clears throat> it's, uh, you know, it's just really interesting. So the kids that are coming out of, of the School of Architecture today are not getting that information either. I mean, unless they go on their own, I think he was saying that they had to um uh, you know, go online and stuff. And there's a, a lot of information online, but, and then I think he was saying like some of the professors were not acknowledging that and they need to, because, um, you know, so I just, I just thought that was very interesting. But then also I wanted to answer um, my answers to the question. So question number one, I was saying, um, yes, there should be more narrative, certainly for the Native Americans um, and, and especially in Minnesota, you know, this is Dakota land. So we need, a lot more um, history and preservation of the Dakota people, the Ojibwe. Um, so they're and their, um, is that right? The people's um, preservations and their history should be told. Um, the Mexican Americans in St. Paul, the history, they've been here for over 100 years. So their historic preservation should be, you know, I certainly I think they've been left out. The African Americans, you know, our history. And preservation. Um, you know, we did that context study, so hopefully, you know, we're trying to to get some of that done. Um, also, the Asian Americans in in St. Paul, their his historic preservation should definitely be preserved in their history told. Um, the Hmong people, you know, there are so many um, other histories that, and I know as a, as an educator and you know in elementary school, um, it, you know, I taught for 16 years and and. And we would try to bring it in, but it's not part of the curriculum. You know, hopefully, maybe today it is. I doubt it. <laughs> but, um, and then uh, let's see, also, what was I thinking? Is that what I said? Oh, also, then I'm going on to number two, the question. So I think that through education and recognizing these other cultural histories um, and places and preserving them. That would answer that question. And then number three, if we actually do number two, what I just said, I think it will change. 
So that's that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Douglas. Any any other discussion on this topic? Commissioner with George, did you have anything to weigh in on this? Um, I, I really don't have any more to add at this time. Thank you, though. Thank you. The only thing I would, would add is just uh, teeing off a little bit on what Commissioner Douglas was just saying, and that is, um, it, it, it's, you know, there's, uh, with some communities, either ones that have not been established here for a long time, or particularly like communities like the Native American communities where they're not, where they're, there's no longer very much physical structure um, representing their heritage and their history. I, but I think we need to start thinking more creatively on how we can still effectively recognize that heritage and that history um, within the city um, without having, you know, a building that says, you know, this, this represents it. So, um, it, it's just a, it's just a reminder that we need to, to think about it. It's not just preservation of buildings, it's preservation of heritage. And we need to figure out new forms that that can take. And, and you know, because, mostly looking at well, I just buildings. Wanted to add. <laughs> I just wanted to add to yeah. that because, um, you know, there, there are so many historical places that are, that do right. still exist, you know, and, and the, like when they just renamed um, Lake Calhoun, uh, the right. Macaska, and um, then there's the mounds, the, um, uh, the mounds here in St. Paul. The, you know, there, there are all kinds of historic places that the Native Americans know that still exist, you know, and that's probably, that's the problem. You know, they've, you know, either you know, try to destroy them or, um, you know, they're just, they're just not recognized, although they do exist. Commissioner Bazat, did you have some further comments? Well, again, this, this presentation is sort of pushing back about the way these issues were presented in this particular seminar really sparked a whole bunch of sort of answers to those three questions. And I think as we go further along to have our discussions, and I'm hopeful there will be an opportunity to have another commission meeting that, that focuses on these topics. But in terms of the counter narratives, I think both Teresa and Lietta have, have hit it on the, the nose. And particularly, for instance, with the African American context study, seem to have been wrapped in a bag, weighted down with rocks and dropped into a deep pool. You know, the, there is there is so much that could be done with that in terms of cultural context. You know, when we looked at that report on the area surrounding the soccer field, and I can't remember what the name of the field is. Sorry, Christine. <laughs> um, you know, the, the Hamlin Hotel, came up in the discussions about things that were missed as important cultural locations. And one of the things that came out of at least two of these seminars last summer was we don't have to be, and in fact, we talked about it with the Miriam Park report. We don't have to be looking at buildings by super famous quote, important architects. Um, one of the sites, in I think it, it might have been uh, San Antonio or so, some location was the first home, the first meeting place of the Black Panthers. And it was just, you know, this, this little storefront, but talk about a hugely important heritage site to the country and the succeeding movements, you know, and, and the things that perhaps I recognize it takes money, but you know the the Frogtown intensive survey and how that can contribute to more information about not just the current residents, but how it grew and those streets and streets full of workers' cottages. Who lived in them? What did they? 
Um, what did they do? How did they participate? What were the community sites that were important to them? And then the whole issue of healing versus perpetuating injustice comes to mind when I think about um, the pushback against a cultural designations. I think that both the National Park Service in creating standards and discussing standards and putting out information about standards can do a lot more to focus on the cultural context. And I think that would help dissolve some of the structural racism against non-white that that perpetuates white culture in the city of St. Paul. And taking a look, like like Lietta says, there are tons of sites down on um, on the the flats, you know, by Our Lady of Guadalupe has been around forever and ever and ever. Mm -hmm. And you know these these sites are crucial to the history of St. Paul and it need they need to get not just investigated but recognized and raised to equal importance as places like the governor's mansion or any of these you know summit Ave east summit avenue uh, mansions of the lumber barons and the other movers and shakers in the financial community at the time. So I think there's there are a lot of counter narratives available. We just have to capitalize on them. So yeah, I, I agree with what's been said. Thank you, Commissioner Mazan. Anybody else want to weigh on this any further? Any further. This is the Commissioner McDonald. Yes, McDonald. Yeah. yeah, maybe as a sidebar, but it might be interesting to note that uh, uh, MnDOT, the Department of Transportation, has had a, a lot of collaborative projects with uh, Native American tribes, and we've been uh, fortunate to work on several. Um, currently, uh, with the Mille Lacs tribe at, uh, around in and around Mille Lacs Lake, and also with the uh, Leech Lake tribe. Um, some are significant in terms of archaeology, which is a whole different matter. Um, <clears throat> but the one at Leech Lake in particular, I find fascinating. It's, it's a matter of history and storytelling. Um, there are no archaeological implications for the site we're working on, but um, it's the scene of uh, a historic battle on Leash Lake. And there's an interpretive plaque from uh, the WPA period, which is very Eurocentric and frankly wrong. <laughs> and we are working with the tribe and MnDOT to develop uh, a new interpretation for the site um, uh, as we speak. And uh, so the interpretation will be, in addition to the WPA work, it will be of the uh, Native American uh, response to what happened uh, in the 19th century there. Um, so I, I think there are some positives that uh, uh, we can take, but it's, uh, it's, it's a matter of um, listening. Um, for instance, we're learning to our amazement that the sense of time and history in the Native American community is very different than ours. Um, it's not linear, it's not by calendar, it's it's uh, more esoteric than that, um, which also makes it very difficult to interpret, which is why we're doing it as a collaborative effort. So uh, at any rate, I thought I would just inject that. That's an interesting point because that's like Louise Erdrich's books aren't necessarily linear stories. Mm -hmm. They're written very much from the perspective of her community. And I mean, MnDOT had a huge wake up call when they were redoing a bridge on Highway 23 up near the Fond du Lac Reservation, where they discovered by accident that they were 
digging up an area that had been a burial ground. So cultural sensitivity has got, you know, it involves not just the awareness, but the actual both physical digging and research and taught as Stu said, as Commissioner McDonald says, listening to communities and learning the names, which is a fascinating, just learning the names, working on this landscape event for this coming fall um, and writing essays on some of these sites and learning just the, the names are becoming more more familiar to me than the park board names for some of these sites and the signs that are going up for instance along the bruce fento nature sanctuary simply noting you are on dakota land you know so that sort of sensibility needs to come into play with with the physical preservation of buildings that may not look like spectacular architecture, but are hugely important culturally. And I don't, I don't think, I don't think we can emphasize that enough as preservation moves forward. And you know, Madam Chair, I'm just thinking too. You know, we're saying that you know maybe their the Native American history isn't written down or whatever. It's like you know European history or whatever. But you know, we need to invite the Native Americans in to speak about it because they certainly know their history. I mean, I've been to a lot of um, workshops and and seminars where um, you know Dakota people were speaking in Ojibwe, and they can tell you about all the stuff that's going that's here in St. Paul that's um, that's sacred and you know the mounds and all of that, the burial grounds and everything. And I was just thinking about. Um, uh, a Fort Snelling, where I remember I was um, I was in a, a lecture series and they were saying how the the Trail of Tears that's where they brought the Native Americans to Fort Snelling, and um, you know when they took their land, sold their land, and and marched them to, to Fort Snelling, and they had to live right under the Mendota Bridge, right there. And every time I go across that bridge, it's real eerie to me now. Now that I know that that that's what happened, and you know hundreds of them died. There, you know, going through the winters in Minnesota and everything. It's really, you know, the history is just really um, profound and, and sad. And, um, you know, if we if we were just more aware of that, you know, I mean, my goodness, we live in, in Minnesota and we should know that Native American history. You know, I was at a, um, a workshop or a gathering that we had and there was a, um, an, I, I believe he was Ojibwe, the man, and he stood there and he, he told the people in the room, you know, it was, a, it was a little gathering, they had food and everything, and he said, I just want to welcome all of you to my land. And I cried because that's the first time, you know, I mean, I, I'm born and raised in St. Paul, Minnesota, and I'm African American, and I know that, you know, this is not my land, you know, I know it's their land, and I just felt so... It was just it was just really sweet that he was welcoming and it was a group of um, people of different cultures, you know, in the room. And he just said, I want to welcome all of you to my land. And I just thought that was just just so sweet. So, you know, if we would just respect other people's cultures and, you know, I just wish everybody could just get along. <laughs> beautiful. Just beautiful. Commissioner Douglas. <laughs> Yeah. Madam Chair? Yes, Commissioner Perlka. You know, um, uh, speaking of the uh, uh, Native people of Minnesota, of uh, uh, this land, even the understanding of land is different. It's not just the property, it's the rocks, the sky above, uh, the wind, uh, the vegetation, uh, the creatures and um, and everything, but I would just uh, also uh, point to the recent uh, historic Dakota land return uh, involving the Lower Sioux Indian community as a uh, good first step, um, and that seems to be what uh, and um. um a lot of uh, 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 Native communities 
have uh, uh, heritage and preservation commissions of their own. And we might, um, I certainly would be interested in hearing from them. And, uh, um, but yeah, the historic Dakota uh, land return uh, involving the Lower Sioux uh, Indian community, I think is significant. Um, and uh, says that uh, at least in Minnesota, uh, we're doing um, some, we're, we're, we are starting to look in a different direction, but it's going to be a long, long road. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Parroquin. Any other discussion on this topic? I'll just run through the roll call one more time just to make sure. Uh, Commissioner Bazant. Nothing more, thank you. Thank you, thank Commissioner you. Douglas. Oh, I just want to say, you know, I, I think we're headed in the right direct direction because at least a lot of people are talking about these things now. And, you know, it's taken all the way till 2021 <laughs> for people to, you know, wake up and try to understand and, and you know, um, respect and, and um, recognize other cultures and their historic preservation uh, and presence. And um, I, I just think it's, you know, it's looking up. I think things are going to happen. Thank you, Commissioner Douglas. Uh, Commissioner George. Um, I would just like to say that. Yes, thank you. I would just like to say that um, listening to uh, everyone's comments and thoughts about uh, preservation, whether it be the building or the land or the people that have moved here and so on, has been very, very well done. And I, I appreciate everything that the people have, that fellow commissioners have said regarding this this issue and this situation. And um, it, it's a, it's just a very uh, almost touching at times to listen, and I thank you all. Thank you, Commissioner George. Uh, Commissioner McDonald, anything further? Uh, nothing further, thank you. Thank you. And Commissioner Perot, anything further? Uh, nothing further, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then I'll just one more time. If any anybody want to add anything more here? <laughs> if not, oh, Commissioner uh, Commissioner Bazad. As always, I'm sorry. I just would really encourage us to continue the conversation and begin to find concrete ways to work towards this, because clearly it's crucial both to the preservation effort and to the the, the city. I, I just really think it's important. So if there's any way that we can create an agenda for one, for a commission meeting that may have a, a short business agenda, that would be, I think it would be useful for all of us because we're clearly all engaged. I am glad you said that. Because I've, I've already started gearing our next one. I have been finding a lot of very interesting articles. So, so it won't be a, a, anything that you just sit and listen to. Uh, we're going to have some reading to do. But I have a couple of real interesting articles about actual take actually taking action and how we can do that. And then I think uh, we'll follow up sometime um, in the fall. Um, uh, education outreach. We're going to do this uh, some sort of preservation fair, and I think we're going to try to to have another kind of listing session conversation about where we're at and where we've kind of the journey we've taken this past year. So, I will start sending some of the reading materials out in advance because some of them are large. So, hey, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. All right, if there's nothing more, I would entertain a motion to adjourn.
So moved. That's Commissioner, Commissioner George. <laughs> Commissioner George, uh, thank you for moving. And Commissioner Douglas, did you second that motion? Yes, I'll, Here, second. I'll second. Thank you. Any opposition to that motion? If not, we are adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Okay. See you later.